Matthias, aka Mr. 16 Bars, that's real hip hop. Try to tell people that Philly is a special breed They hate to see us on top, they hate to see us on They hate to see us come up, they hate we on They hate the moves that we make, because it's made to break them We give them knowledge on tracks, and hope our words can save them I guess it's hard to get props, when you know you lesser So we right on your heels, I hope you feel the pressure Rappers taking a roll, my shoes will never fit them Before you come at a king, I let my soldiers get them I'm from Philly, with hot quarters, they turn chilly Tight shirts, with tight jeans, they never feel me Young boys confused, they think I'm too preachy, old head in the game and still rep my city. I'm from Philly, where hot corners they turn chilly. Tight shirts with tight jeans, they never feel me. Young boys can. Welcome to this episode of Philly on the Rise. As you know, I'm your host, Michael W. Pleasant. This week, Philly on the Rise finds us in our downtown studios. We're actually joined by Movina Johnson Harrell. Uh, she is running for. What are you running for? I'm running for state representative. She's running for state representative yeah. of the 190th district in Philadelphia, which encompasses parts of West Philly mm -hmm. and some other districts as well. So she's taken some time out of her schedule to join us on the program. Movita, welcome to Philly on the Rise. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's good to have you here. Yeah. You actually uh, came from two events prior. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm currently on the campaign trail. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So I know that you have been a uh, lifelong Philadelphia resident, social worker by trade, but now you decided to get into politics. Why politics? Well, I didn't decide to get into politics. I was kind of thrust into this journey. Um, I've done some work in different areas and I found myself advocating. I've been an advocate for over 20 years for marginalized communities okay. and people who are disadvantaged. We're talking about people living under the poverty level, the chronically mentally ill, people with addictions, and also children, people with intellectual disabilities. So I've been an advocate and I've worked to advocate for these different marginalized groups, and I found myself more recently advocating on a different level for our children as far as education and safety. So I found myself up in Harrisburg and up in Washington and organizing rallies and participating in marches, and someone said to me at one point, you know, there's some offices, you should run for office. And I said, but I'm not a politician, I'm a social worker. Okay. And they said, well, we need more social workers in politics. And it was like a light bulb went off for me. A light bulb went off for yeah. you at that moment. So let's talk about your motivation, because you've been back and forth to Harrisburg, yep. back and forth to DC, as you mentioned, advocating for marginalized communities, those who are in need. What is your driving force? Well, the driving force is that our children deserve better than what they're receiving. Mm -hmm. Our communities deserve better than what they're receiving. We have communities that are underrepresented and underserved, and I've lived in those communities my whole life. And I understand, coming from five generations of poverty, I understand what it's like for families to have generational welfare. Mm, and mm. we need hope for our communities, we need hope for our people, we need to give them the resources that they need to be able to come out of these dilemmas. You mentioned generational poverty. Uh, we just finished the show with we were talking about how to build generational wealth but mm -hmm. in your idea how can we break that cycle decades and decades of generational poverty it's, over time we can break it but what do you think are some of the steps well I think some of the first things that we need to do is we need to teach our children about money we need to teach our children about credit and education is key if we give them the information then they can make better decisions you know we have a lot of people that that work we have the working poor who live below the poverty level mm -hmm. and can't seem to climb out most of us are not educated about money as children so if we start there with educating our children and educating the consumer, they can make better decisions. Sure, sure, sure. Let's talk about the 190th district. Yes. Uh, you're excited to run for that seat, state representative. Yes. Let's talk specifically to those folks because they have their own issues. Absolutely. And that's, again, West Philly, parts of, uh, what, is it University There's City parts as well? of North Philadelphia. Okay. There's West Philly. There's Strawberry Mansion. Okay. Um, so the thing is, is that in the 190, the 190th runs from, City Line Avenue to Larchwood from East Falls to 52nd and then it becomes a little gerrymandered like at March it goes all the way over the I mean at Market Street it goes all the way over to the 60th so we have quite a few business districts in the 190th that have basically died mm. because we have buildings that are dilapidated we have buildings that used to house 
successful businesses, but those businesses have left the district. We need to bring business enterprise back to the district. We need to create our own economic wealth. Okay. We need to create our own jobs in our communities, and we do that through economic development and bringing organizations into our communities that are going to provide jobs for the residents that live in those communities. Sure. So you grew up in parts of West Philly, parts yep. of Southwest Philly, and now you're back representing the people, the neighborhoods that you grew up. Let's talk about those neighborhoods, and they've probably changed over the years. Absolutely. There's been some gentrification. As you mentioned earlier, the businesses have left. Uh, where do you see the neighborhood going? Well, right now, Mike, I see a fine line between affluence and poverty, and we need to blur that line. Um, there's an issue going on right now with gentrification in that community. Also, there's a lot of predatory observations going on. You know, you have um, programs that benefit new people coming into the district as opposed to benefiting the residents that have been there for generations. Yeah. Um, there's also an issue now where in that specific community in West Philly, homes are being stolen from under people. If someone fills out a deed and signs the owner's name, um, basically forging their signature, and as long as they fill out the paperwork right, they can take that paperwork into City Hall and basically steal that property from under that residence. And are you saying someone out of the blue? Is it a family member? Or it could just be anyone walking down the it street? It could just be anyone walking down the street. Oh. And typically it happens to our senior citizens in the district. Okay, okay. Let's return back to what you said a couple of moments ago. Uh, you mentioned how there are some programs that are giving money to folks who don't live in that district. Mm -hmm. But those who live in the district, they're not getting some of those funds. What's Absolutely. That about? Well, there are programs that the university offer to their students okay. and to their faculty yeah. that if they buy into that neighborhood, if they purchase a property in that neighborhood, they get tax incentive. Okay. They're eligible for low interest loans. They're eligible for specific grants. And these programs are not allotted to the people who have been in that neighborhood mm -hmm. for generations. Um, so I think if we're going to do that, that's all well and fine. If we're going to do that, we can do that, but we need to also make accommodations for the people that have been in that neighborhood, who have raised their families in that neighborhood, who now may be struggling as a result of these new property owners with mm. these higher income properties and taxes going up. We need to have programs that will accommodate these people. Sure, sure. So economic development is a platform of yours. Absolutely. We also know that uh, gun violence. Yes. Is a platform of yours as well. Let's talk a little bit about that platform. Okay. Well, most people know that gun violence is very dear to my heart um, because on January 13th, 2011, my youngest child of four, Charles Andre Johnson, was murdered in a case of mistaken identity. Um, and the thing that happened was it was so devastating for me. I mean, as an adult, these four children, I lived my life to provide the best that I could for my children. Um, my son didn't sell drugs, he didn't sling guns, he didn't do anything. You know, he worked every day caring for 100 chronically mentally ill adults. Mm. And one thing that we found out once Homicide did their investigation was that two boys were beefing over a girl and they thought my son was the other boy coming back to retaliate. And they killed my son. Wrong place, wrong time. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. So since that time, 90 days to the day my son died, I created the Charles Foundation. Charles is an acronym for Creating Healthy Alternatives Results in Less Emotional Suffering. Since my son died, we have been going into schools, teaching safety workshops to children, um, educating them to make better choices. Um, we go into the prison. We talk to the Lifers Association. I do an impact of crime class in Gratiford Prison. We try and decrease recidivism rates among incarcerated people and also when they come back. We don't have good plans for incarcerated people when they come back and that's why our recidivism rates are so high. On top of that, mass incarceration. You know, we're closing down schools but we're building more prisons. That doesn't make sense. And then when we hear things like, well, there's a third grade predictor that will tell if a child will wind up in prison, I say we're setting our children up for failure. Wow, let's talk about that recidivism rate a little bit because folks who come out of prison, if they go back into that same environment that they were in that originally got them into prison in the first place, then there's a high chance that they're going to 
repeat the same steps, yes. repeat the same mistakes. So once someone comes out, is it a matter of changing your environment as well as changing your mindset? How can we decrease that recidivism? Um, I think we need to do two things. I think we need to educate our returning citizens so that they're not making the same mistakes. And then we need to provide resources for them. For example, jobs. Now when you say we, do you mean we the government? We the people? Who is we? I mean we everybody. It has to be a combination of us all. So yes, we need federal funds to help provide resources. We need citizens who have returned, who are in the community and doing positive things to basically mentor our returning citizens so that they can have somebody when they have an idea to make a bad choice. They have someone that they can talk to. Um, but we need to be providing, you know, a lot of times we talk about rehabilitation. You can't rehabilitate someone if they've never been habilitated in the first place. So we have to provide habilitation. We have to provide common sense solutions, jobs, a lot of times, our young men go into prison, they come out with felonies. Felonies are prohibitive offenses. You can't hire, specific jobs can't hire people with felonies. So we talk about expungement clinics. That's not good for a felon. You can't expunge a felony. You know, and then to get a pardon is so hard, because that has to come from the governor. So what we need to do is, we need to keep them from getting these charges in the first place. Mm and then they won't have to worry about these issues once they come out. But once they get the charges and they're released from prison, once they do their time, we need to give them a break. Because it seems like our society continues to hurt those people with those same things that they've already paid their time Now, what for. do you consider giving someone a break? What does that mean exactly? Giving them a break means that if someone has a prohibitive offense, let's say that they can get a job after two years after they come out. So, Right now, there are certain jobs that if a person has a prohibitive felony, they can never work in a certain field. A nursing field, for example. So this keeps people from getting jobs. Let's say someone goes in for drug dealing and they have a felony case. Well, if they come back, if they come back to the community and try and get a job and can't get a job, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to go back to selling drugs. Correct, correct, correct. So we have to come up with some real solutions that's going to help our people. Sure, sure. Let's return back to the Charles Foundation because yes. you are doing some amazing things with the Charles Foundation and it's obviously near and dear to your heart. Uh, folks want to get involved. How can they have you come to their school? The Charles Foundation, that is. How can they have mm -hmm. the Charles Foundation come to their school? We would gladly come to your school, come to your community meeting, um, provide resources. We have a food cupboard. The Charles Foundation has a food cupboard. So if there are hungry families, we will feed you. So they can either email us at thecharlesfoundation.org, that is our webpage, or they can call 412-CHARLES, 412-242-7437. Aha, aha, so people of the 190th district, they see what they're getting if they were to vote for you. Absolutely. Someone who's fiery, compassionate about the needs of that community. What else are they getting if they happen to vote for Movita Johnson Harrell? What are they getting if they vote for Movita Johnson Harrell? They're getting a woman that's true to her word. They're getting a woman that, I didn't ask for this. This was thrust upon me. And I'm a very spiritual woman. And when this fell into my lap, I shot up one prayer. I said, God, if this is your will for my life, make it so evident that I can't deny it. And what happened was he made it so evident that I can't deny it. Mm. And on many days, I feel like I'm sitting in the car, but I'm sitting in the passenger seat and the car is being driven. Mm. And I'm just going along for the ride. So I'm just doing what I'm being told to do. I'm being obe obedient to the path that's being laid for me. That is a great ride that you're on. And you have the full support of the Filling the Rise uh, TV Thank show. You, full Michael. support of our family. Thanks a lot for Thank you. coming down and joining us. Uh, you have seen what this uh, young lady here is about, how she's doing some powerful things in our city, powerful, thing, powerful things for you. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Billy on the Rock. That real hip hop. Y'all know how we do. You're listening to Free Zone, Matthias, aka Mr. 16 Bars. That real hip hop. Try to tell people that Philly is a special breed They hate to see us on top, they hate to see us on